den första talaren det är Lukas. Eh, en, en kär kollega som jag har som sitter i Holland. Och eh, han är med att hjälpa när skadan har skett. Alltså, hur snabbt kan vi komma tillbaka till produktion och sånt. Eh, så jag är varm välkomna eh, Lukas. Eh, sessionen är på engelska. Eh, over to you Lukas. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks Johnny for the nice introduction. Um, and this presentation uh, will be about what happens when the Trend Micro Incident Response Team gets engaged. I will take all of you on a short 30 minute journey showing all the interesting parts of the incident response process. But you should know that the incident response process is an incredibly broad topic that we can fill at least three days with. But since we only have um, about 29 minutes left now, I'll quickly get to introducing my, myself and the team and then talk about some of the technical aspects of the IR process. So my name is Lucas. I'm based in the Netherlands and I'm uh, one of the incident response coordinators. The IR team consists of nine people and it's a mix of six analysts and two coordinators. On the background, we also have the professional services team uh, working uh, hard on supporting us on cases, which is a group of about 20 people. So when does incident response get engaged? It is usually after you find out that your credentials are up for sale on the dark web, uh, which usually results in ransomware affiliates buying them. You can see a screenshot here of the Stanford University where a web shell was being sold for $950. Um, and then um, if it's being sold and you come into the office on Monday morning, you try to log on to a server, there's a big chance that you will be greeted by one of those screens that you cannot log on into your servers anymore. And then upon further, further investigation, you will find a ransom note. And in that ransom note, you will get a onion link. Uh, the onion link uh, will um, um, redirect you to the um, ransomware affiliates website, which looks like, uh, li like this. And on this website, this is um, a blog website from the ransomware groups. And this is not a place where they um, upload holiday pictures. This is the place where they... Um, um, publicize all of the leaked uh, data from their ransomware victims. Um, after that, you can also negotiate with the uh, uh, with the threat actor, with the ransomware operator to um, um, talk about the ransom payment and decide if you want to pay or not to pay. Um, but anywhere in that process, you can um, decide to call the incident response team. Um, and that's something that you definitely need to do, of course. Um, we don't just engage with ransomware. Uh, we also engage with advanced persistent threats um, or with the thing we call breach assessment. So if you have a hunch or a, um, um, a finding where you think that your infrastructure is breached, um, like you've been hit by the Hafnium Zero Day or you are using uh, one of the software packages from one of the recent supply chain uh, attacks, you can also engage with the incident response team to, um, um, to find out what the um, um, health of your infrastructure looks like to make sure um, that you've not been breached or to at least get information on if you've been breached. So the first thing that you should always do is check your incident response plan. And what should your incident response plan include? That is um, um, uh, some steps. And there's a couple of frameworks for this that you can use. You can use the SUNS or the NIST incident response framework, and it consists of six steps. It starts with the preparation phase. It goes into the identification phase because you need to know what you're facing. Then the containment and eradication phase, which go hand in hand and which usually takes um, the longest um, um, of those six uh, phases. You go into the recovery phase and then into the lessons learned phase. And throughout this presentation, I will use this framework to show you exactly how the IR team goes about, how it works and what we do. So let's start at the preparation phase. The first thing that we always do when IR gets engaged is we have a so-called triage call. And triaging is a French term used in the medical world um, that's being used to um, um, identify the priorities, identify the victims, and identify who needs help first. And that's exactly the same thing that we do when a customer comes to us um, for an incident response engagement. We talk to the customer on a technical level and we ask them questions about their technical infrastructure. We see what servers have been infected, 
we uh, try to figure out what type of business they're in. So to determine which service to prioritize, which domains to prioritize, and to make um, a list of um, um, of actions that we need to uh, that we need to set up. During that triage call, we also set up two different teams. For the first team being the crisis management team, the second one being the crisis engineering team. And it's really important that we have those two different teams where the management team includes the stakeholders from the management, but also the shareholders and the uh, team leaders or the directors from the different engineering teams. Because you can imagine if your organization has been ransomware and your business operations are down, there are going to be a lot of questions that are uh, being raised uh, from the press, but also internally. And that's where we want to keep the management team uh, in the loop and um, keep them informed. So when we need to make decisions, we have a very quick um, um, uh, line to the uh, to the complete management team and to all of the stakeholders. Then we have the crisis engineering team, and that's the team that's doing all of the uh, the technical works. So migrating servers, um, finding backups, recovering backups, um, doing the forensics. So that's also including our own incident response team. Um, and once we have a green light, the engagement starts right away. This is not limited to nine to five business hours. Um, so it is always a very high speed, high octane engagement um, that usually lasts about 10 days. And it is, you know, it can be um, uh, 15 hour working days, um, depending on the severity of the, uh, of the incident, of course. So how does the rest of the organization look like then? We usually have one coordinator, that's me, from the incident response team. And then we have one or two analysts from the IR team doing the actual um, uh, host based forensics and the network forensics that we'll get to um, in a minute. So how do we keep everybody informed? Well, we set up daily calls and we have daily reports and we keep track of all of the tasks that are being set out. As you can imagine, there's also some crisis management going on because it's usually um, a, a real crisis situation. So we have um, daily or two daily uh, calls um, where we um, inform all of the stakeholders, so the crisis management team uh, and the technical team, and we discuss the open tasks, we discuss what needs to be done, we discuss the priorities, and from there on, we keep track of what needs to be done to make sure the environment is back up um, as safe as possible. The second phase would be the identification phase. And this is important because we need to get a clear overview on what is going on in the network. We need to know what threat actor we are facing. And once we know what threat actor we are facing, we can also look at all of the um, TTPs and IOCs of the threat actor um, that we're familiar with from our own threat intelligence um, so we can um, pin down the research and the forensics. So it's really important to um, um, get to the identification phase um, as quickly as possible to gather all of the firewall logs, to gather all of the IDS and IPS logs, switch logs, router logs, basically all of the logging that is enabled inside the infrastructure, we need to have access to um, as quickly as possible. And then a second step with, that we do here is configure emergency containment policies. And that is where our remediation checklist comes into play. This is a, um, a playbook that's about five pages long. And it contains about 15 steps that really limit the threat actor's um, possibilities to gain persistence and perform lateral movement techniques. So this is all about disabling macros, about disabling or limiting PSXEC, WMI, um, enabling PowerShell logging, and all of those things combined will make sure that the threat actor will have a, um, a, a real more difficult time moving around in the network. Um, so this is one of those lists that we give the, um, um, the crisis engineering team right away so they can implement it. And um, that usually um, is some low hanging fruit to inhibit the threat actor from moving around in the network. Then there's three things that we always say that needs to be done. The first being that we need to gain visibility, we need to harden the endpoints in the servers, and we need to isolate the infected domains. And those are three um, um, points that we really stress during the investigation. And we'll go over those three points during this, uh, during this slideshow. So gaining visibility is really important because we need to know what the threat actor is doing. 
We need to know if they're still in the network. We need to know if they've already left. We need to know what's going on. And that's where we bring this big Pelican case with us and, and it contains a deep discovery inspector. And that is a breach detection system. That's a device that we hook up to your network. Um, we configure span ports on your switches and we throw as much network traffic to the DDI as possible. This, um, this device will then analyze and sponge up all of the network traffic and it will hold it against a list of about 8,000 rules um, that we've made ourselves and um, it will give a hit or not. So what this device will do is it will perform deep packet inspection. So it will actually look inside of the ethernet packets and see if there's a malicious payload or not. If there's a malicious payload because it's being hit against those, uh, those rule lists, um, we get a hit in our backend and from that information, we can act upon it. So you can imagine that if you um, uh, span a 10 gig port to this uh, to this breach detection system, um, there's going to be lots of events generated. And that's true. We can um, get hundreds of thousands of alerts per day. And then it's the, um, the magic of the IR analyst to analyze all of those alerts, create a baseline of what's normal, and then see all of the anomalies that are standing out. And that's why it's so important that we have a really close feedback loop with the um, um, with the engineering team, because we'll be seeing PSXEC coming uh, from strange IP addresses abroad in the middle of the night. Uh, we'll be seeing SSH connections coming in. Uh, we'll be seeing uh, um, all sorts of things on the network um, where we need to verify if it is legit or not. If it's legit, we add it to the baseline. Everything's good, and we won't receive alerts of that anymore. But if it's malicious, then we can um, uh, directly act upon it and um, contain the domain or the servers where, where needed. So gaining visibility is really, really important in the whole incident response uh, process. And we use the DDI for this to, um, to help us. So the containment and er eradication phase, really important. Um, so I've already talked about the DDI monitoring and the next phase or the next uh, step there in this phase is the host-based forensics. Because just looking on the network only gives us so much visibility. We also need to look in the past what has happened. Um, so we try to find out what the root cause is. We try to find the patient zero. And the only way to look in the past is to do host-based forensics. And I want to show you some examples of uh, host-based forensics because it is fascinating to see. Um, everything what you do on a Windows machine is logged, everything. And I want to give you some examples. So we try to find evidence of user communications, file downloads, program execution, file opening and creation, uh, file knowledge, physical locations, USB key usage, account uses, usage, browser usage. Um, combining all of those um, evidence of categories, we can create a forensic report and we can do some forensic research to determine how the threat actor actually got onto, uh, onto the network. But then we need to pin it down because 99% of the forensic analysis focuses on 1% of the data, meaning we can create a forensic report um, being 200 pages per endpoint or per machine, but that's not the goal what we want to achieve. What we want to find mainly is the patient zero, and we want to find out how the threat actor got into the network and if they moved laterally to any other systems. Um, and we do it with host-based forensics. So there's a few steps that we, uh, that we go through. We image the, uh, the RAM, we check for disk encryption, we create a triage disk image, we analyze the triage image, and then we, entire, uh, then we image the entire hard drive. So we image the RAM because it contains a lot of data. I'll show you in the next slide. Um, we check for disk encryption because if the machine is still on, um, then we have the chance to create a, a, a quick system image. And the triage image is basically a, um, a computer image of the, uh, of the hard drive containing just the most important elements for the forensic investigation. So you can imagine a complete um, image of a domain controller can be a couple hundred gigs, whilst if you only uh, image the event logs and all of the registry hives and some other things um, like uh, the Windows folder and uh, the downloads folder, and the documents, it can be a much smaller subset. So let's look at the, uh, the ROM process, volatile data. 
it is super, super important that we also get the run, not just because we can see all of the running processes at that time, um, we can see open files, we can um, uh, see volatile registry keys, but we can also see network connections that are being, um, um, that are open at that moment. But most importantly, of course, is memory only exploits. Because nowadays, exploits don't just exist on your hard drive anymore. Um, they have very clever ways to just being executed in the, uh, in the memory. And that's why we need to have an image of the, um, of the RAM. So next up, the disk analysis is really important. We do uh, data stream carving, file carving. That is me. That means uh, trying to retrieve deleted files and, um, um, and more volatile data such as uh, chats. And then we do registry forensics. And that's fascinating. I'll show you because everything that you do on a Windows machine is being stored in the registry somewhere. I'll give you an example. Um, the search bar in your, um, in your Windows 7 or Windows 10 machine, it's being recorded. We have the recent documents. There's a registry key for it. We have the, um, in the open and save dialog, the little drop down there, those file names are being recorded. Um, we have the recently opened executables with the time frames on it. It's there. We have the run dialog, all of the entries in there. It's also there. It's being recorded. The quick access toolbar in Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 11, it's also there. All of your recent files and even the thumbnails of all of your files that are on your system are being recorded. Um, there's a special file for it. It's not in the registry, but I want to stress the fact that everything you do on a Windows machine will be recorded. And that is what we are trying to find on servers and endpoints that have been infected. We want to create a timeline of how a threat actor went about on the machine. Um, so I'll give you some fun examples on what we can do. So one of the most important parts that we do is track account usage. Because a threat actor to, um, to move laterally, they need to have an account that they use. They need to um, 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 use RDP, for example, to, um, to, uh, to, to hop onto a next server. So tracking account usage, there's two event IDs that are really important. That's 4778 and 4779. That's a session reconnect and a disconnect. And here you can see, based on the event logs, on a Windows system that we have evidence of a type 10 logon, that is RDP, going from um, the M4500 machine using the help desk account from a system uh, with the host name Cooler. So if you put those two event IDs together and you link them together, you can see that the machine M4500 RDP to the Cooler machine. And that's how you start building a, um, a timeline. So the, in case you're not familiar with the logon IDs, that's one of those things that every forensic analyst, uh, analyst needs to know from the top of his head, um, that for example, a type 10 logon is, um, is using RDP. But there's an incredible amount of, um, of information in the, um, um, in the event logs, um, such as this one. This is evidence of a network-based password guessing attack on the help desk account. So if you read the, um, uh, the right part, you can see it's a uh, event log ID uh, 4625. That's an account filled to log on. And you can see it completely filled to the brim with this, uh, with this event ID, meaning they've been trying to brute force um, um, uh, one of the accounts. When you put all of this together, you get a super timeline. There's um, some automated ways to do this. Um, so you can actually um, use an open source tooling such as Lock to Timeline to um, go from a, um, um, a triage image to a timeline. But then you need to filter out all of the non-important items and all of the important items. So this is one of the timelines that we've actually created for, um, uh, for one of our uh, um, breach um, assessment investigations. And let's go over it real quick to show you what type of um, um, evidence we found on a, uh, on a breached machine. So we did an investigation um, against the patient zero and we did a root, root cause analysis. So on the 19th of October, a user received an email with a malicious attachment called calculation something something that's it. All right, fair enough, because if you look at the email, it was actually coming from a legit email. It was replying from a legit email, which is interesting. So that gives the idea, okay, they know me, they're from my address book, maybe I can open it up. 
So let's see what they did. The user opened the attachment, but the content did not display on the screen. And the user thought that either the attachment is corrupt or they do not have the appropriate software to open it. Fair enough. So what did they do? Therefore, they forwarded the email to two other users asking to see if they could open it, which is like the worst thing you could do, right? Um, so the user received the email and tried to open the attachment on the host, um, and they encountered the same issue. So all of them thinking, hey, I think there's something wrong with my workstation uh, because I can't open this attachment. I'll just submit a ticket to IT asking for help and seeing if they can open it. Well, IT got the ticket, they opened it up, they looked at the attachment, and they basically found nothing wrong with it. Um, so they found nothing wrong with it, but after um, opening, uh, opening it uh, a few more times, and then the, um, the engineers going into the, um, the Apex One console, that's their, um, um, their antivirus console, they saw lots of alerts popping up. They saw lots of alerts popping up um, that uh, known malware was being uh, being blocked from being executed. At that moment, there was some panic, um, and well so, because um, they didn't know what was going on, and they did not have an incident response process in place. They called the IR team. We got involved, and we did uh, host-based forensics on the machine where they opened up the attachment, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So the attachment contains an XLSB file. And if you double click on it, something happens. This DocuSign um, pop-up goes open and it's asking you to disable um, um, editing and enable the, um, um, the content, the, enabling the dynamic content. If you do so, this DocuSign document will do some interesting things. But first of all, let's look at the EXIF data of the, uh, of the DocuSign file. And you can actually see that it's got some, uh, some acrylic characters in the uh, last modified by uh, field, which is interesting. In terms of attribution, we can you know, probably assume this is from a Russian thread actor. Um, it's not really a, a legit file, as you, um, as you can imagine. Um, so looking at this, um, um, at this file, we can see um, um, the timeline that my, uh, that my colleague made. I'm opening it up on my screen right now because I can't see it on the... Um, on the file, there it is, yeah. So we can see that the user saved the attachment um, and uh, once the archive was opened, at the same time, a log file has been created in a slash shell slash remote folder. And the um, Excel sheet was uh, updated um, with a shell command execution. Then a directory was created, some executables were being dropped and executed. Um, some other directories are being created and in the end, uh, another shell was uh, was being created. Um, looking at the um, uh, at the next uh, forensics, there was a NPL file being dropped in the um, um, in the G Windows folder slash users, and this was executed straight away. So it is likely that this was being executed with a scheduled task. What happens next? Well, we put this file in our sandbox. So we try to analyze what this file is and what is happening. So this file will drop three bad files in the all users profile folder. And these are all being detected by us as a Trojan from Quackbot. Quackbot is um, um, something that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and this was also adding some, uh, some scheduled tasks, which are um, not good, of course. So Quadbot is um, it's part of a trifecta in the whole ransomware chain. Um, there's usually some parties um, that are in charge of the credential stealing or that are in charge of the initial access of an infrastructure. Then comes Quadbot, and Quadbot is usually performing credential stealing, gaining a persistence, setting up command and control servers. And Quadbot will then usually sell off their access to um, a ransomware affiliate such as egregor, reevil, or maze, which will then ransomware you. And a good example of what Quadbot can do was the JBS ransomware attack in Brazil a couple months back, and there they paid a 11 million ransom payment. So um, Quadbot is something that um, is really dangerous, and it is it's it, it's absolutely a good thing that they uh, engage with the incident response team. 
So looking at the lessons learned, there's a couple of things that we can take from this uh, case, of course. The first being that you need to set up an incident response plan. And it, you, know, you don't need to have your own incident response team. Your IR uh, or your incident response plan could be as simple as step one, call the incident response team at Trend Micro. Um, you could go more further, you could more go more extensive, but at least have something in place that when the crisis hits, you know what to do. Second is, test your incident response plan. It's really important to, um, to test it, to make sure the phone numbers are working, the contact details are still okay, um, and evaluate on, um, uh, on those actions. Then the next uh, lessons learned were, of course, to harden the endpoints, harden the email systems, and harden the server environment. All makes sense. Um, also, gaining visibility on the network. That's something to be approved on, improved on because they did not have any network visibility at the time um, um, of the breach or at the suspected breach. Um, they saw in Apex One that there were some um, um, uh, quark pot detections being blocked, but apart from those detections being blocked, they did not have any uh, means to um, look at their network flows. And then of course, last but not least, that is to train the users on security awareness. Um, because a user forwarding a suspected malicious mail to two other users is, of course, a big no-no. That um, uh, should be part of, uh, uh, of an awareness uh, training. Then we always end the incident response engagement with a, a final report. That is usually a report um, that's about um, you know, ranging from 20 pages to 200 pages, uh, going over all of the forensic analysis going over um, um, all of the uh, details, the factual findings that we have, um, and also about the improvements that we have for, uh, for the environment. So this is um, a document that is really interesting for both the, uh, the management team, but also for the technical team. This is a really extensive um, report. So I think I'm coming up to the, to the time. Um, um, oh, I missed the slide here, but it looks like this. I'm coming up to my uh, to my time now. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Um, but please send them uh, in a in a little email to instant underscore response at trendmicro.com, and uh, I'll uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs>